It is one of the sessions that has been disrupted uh, by the weather. Um, so at this point, I would like to patch in the leader of the session, who is Ogilvy PR Global CEO, Chris Graves. And I think we have Chris on the line. You do, Arun. This is Chris <laughs> Graves. How are you? Excellent. I'm very well, Chris. I'll, I'll leave it with you. Thank you very much. Listen, thank you all for showing up this morning, and a huge thank you to the panelists who are there, and I also have one other panelist on the line with me. We were both in the Northeast or Mid-Atlantic and trapped and could not get out, so we apologize for that. We go to the next slide there, Stephanie. I and Ogilvy have been obsessed with behavioral economics and neuroscience for the past several years, I personally become such a nerd. I, I bored my coworkers to tears about this, collecting and digesting more than 800 pieces of primary research. And you'll be able to find a very short uh, recap of that on the literature table. But the fact is, the more we study, the more we see the human brain is this incredible cognitive bias minefield. And those of us in public relations and communicators really need to come to grips with this if we're going to be more effective in our communication. Next, I want to tell you three quick accidents, and that's how I brought this panel together. The first accident, next, involves this young man. You should see him up on the screen now holding that big piece of steel rod. He's Phineas Gage. And picture yourself back in 1848, September 13th. He's a worker on the railroad in Cavendish, Vermont. And his job is to blow up giant boulders in the way of where the railroad needs to go. And so he'd drill a hole in the boulder and then put it full of black gunpowder in the hole and use that big steel rod to tamp it down. But on that afternoon at 4.30 on September 13, 1848, this is what happened. Next, you'll see that the rod went straight up through his skull and out the top. And, of course, it freaked out his coworkers. But he actually wanted to come back to work just six weeks later. He felt everything was just fine. He talked fine. His IQ seemed fine. But a couple of things had changed for Phineas. One was his personality, and the other was he had no ability to make sound decisions. Next, you will see that if you flash forward 150 years, this scientist, Antonio Damasio, who was really obsessed with trying to figure out how humans make opinions, looked at Phineas Gage and looked at current brain-damaged patients and then used a brain-scanning tool called a functional MRI, an fMRI, to try to figure out just how we humans shape opinions and make decisions. And it came down to these two parts of the brain he lists there, the amygdala and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And all you need to take away from this from now as lay people is that the overriding power of emotion, not reason, and human decision-making. Next, he wrote this book, Descartes' Error, and the takeaway from that was he said, it is, uh, we are not thinking machines. We are feeling machines that think. And we're going to keep flying along here. In just a few minutes, you're going to hear from Raymond Marr. You may have read his, uh, the story in the New York Times citing him or even some of his research, but he has a very unique area of uh, neuroscience research related to the impact of fiction on the brain. We'll come back to Raymond in just a few minutes. Next. Accident number two. Next. This is Charles Lord, and in 1979, he performed a seminal piece of research. He was trying to figure out, just as we do every single day, how do you change somebody's mind? And in his research, he had a wonderful, amazing, eye-opening, surprising result. And that result has led to everything you see going on in politics in America today and the formation of channels like Fox and MSNBC. And what he discovered was that if you put evidence in front of humans that proves they are wrong, they don't assimilate that, analyze that, and change their mind. They dig in their heels, they discredit the research, and they take an even more strident point of view, clinging to their original point of view. Next. And he called this confirmation bias, because all we do as humans is accept the evidence that confirms what we already believe. Next. This is Drew Weston, and flash forward uh, about to 20 years from Charles Lord, and he used a new tool. Next. And that tool, you'll see the brain scans up on the screen now. He was discovering that within people 
scanned talking about and looking at their favorite politicians, when they flip-flop, they would forgive them. But if they looked at a, an opponent's politician, the different part of the brain would light up entirely, where you, the part where you think this person is a cheat and a liar. But if it's your own favorite politician, no such thing. You get a little shot of dopamine, which is the same thing you get during sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And so he found that next, this really had nothing to do with reasoning or cognitive thought. This has to do with emotion circuits lighting up. The end of reason. Next, Jason Reifler is going to talk to you in a minute. He's an expert in this field called confirmation bias, sometimes called motivated reasoning, and in particularly related to elections. And I hear we're very close to a very big election soon. So next, the third accident. Next, this man, Giacomo Rizzolatti, was looking at uh, macaque monkeys at the University of Parma in 1990. And in about 1995, a wonderful accident happened. He had put electrodes into the macaque monkey brains trying to isolate very specific neurons. Neurons are little transmitters in the brain. And this is how we map what goes where in the brain. And so in this case, he was mapping very specifically when monkeys pick up food and put it to their mouth. And he had put it up on an audio channel so you could hear it. And it sounded like static, like this. And then a weird and wonderful thing happened one day. One of his colleagues came back into the lab, and he had a little snack and put it into his mouth. And the monkey, merely observing, merely observing the worker, fired off the same neurons in its brain as though it itself were eating the same food. And so it led to an entire field of research now called mirror neurons that's proving humans are wired for empathy. And that's why we come to our third panelist. If you go next, no, it's not Mr. Spock. This is Mr. Spock performing the Vulcan mind meld. But next, our panelist is actually doing the real Vulcan mind meld. His name next is Yuri Kassam, and that's a picture of him up there. And you're going to hear from him very soon. He's dialed in from Princeton, but he works with what he calls neural coupling and brain-to-brain -brain coupling, and it is spine-tingling what you're going to learn about the power of narrative and listening, particularly if you can do as what we've been doing at Ogilvy, which is crafting a unique methodology to leverage all of these findings. So now what I'd like to do is hand it over to Jason Reifler, Jason is there on your panel in front of you. He's the assistant professor of political science at Georgia State University. And he very specifically looks at political behavior, this confirmation bias, why we never admit we're wrong, especially in the face of evidence that we truly are wrong. Jason, over to you. Thank you, Chris. Hi, my name is Jason Reifler, and I'm an assistant professor of political science at Georgia State University. And what I want to talk about today is informing the misinformed. So when people believe things that are, in fact, incorrect, is it possible to get them to update their beliefs to something that is more accurate? And so I'm going to start with both obvious, so I'm going to talk, tell you about obvious and not so obvious <coughs> conclusions from social science. First, the obvious conclusion, which, as PR people you probably know well, is that persuasion is hard. The not so obvious conclusion focuses on why persuasion is hard. Persuasion when I worked in politics prior to becoming an academic, a lot of the reason why we thought that persuasion might be hard was that people weren't listening. That the people that we wanted to talk to were hard to reach. Well, that in fact may be true, but it turns out that there's more reasons why in fact it's really difficult to get people to change their mind, to update their beliefs. So uh, next slide, please. There are several different reasons why people may be vulnerable to misinformation. First is that people may select like-minded sources. That is, we're willing to accept, we enjoy information that uh, reaffirms what we already believe. And so we're going to accept things that uh, are less critical of our worldview, uh, applying less cognitive or mental effort to uh, criticizing those. We reject unwelcome corrections, so information that counters what we already believe. We, in fact, apply a great deal of mental effort towards trying to counter-argue or dismiss in some way. We continue to be influenced after corrections. So some of you may believe 
uh, that I am an award-winning PR person because last night you saw me accept an award on behalf of Ogilvy. Sorry, Chris, if you didn't know that. <clears throat> uh, but in fact, I'm an academic, and the only reason I accepted the award is because nobody else at the table really wanted to get up and do it, and I figured this helps me make a point in my talk tomorrow, in that <clears throat> I went and accepted an award. I'm not a PR professional. I'm an academic, but yet you saw me win an award. And so at some point in the future, if you see a picture of me and try and assess how good I might be at PR, some part of you might say, oh yeah, that guy won an award. Or even if you know I didn't win an award, there's that mental connection that's somewhere in your head. And so you might rate me more positively at doing PR than you otherwise would. And then another problem that we face is that we use familiarity of a claim oftentimes as a heuristic for accuracy. So when we hear things over and over again, the horrible and completely untrue claim that the MMR vaccine causes autism. The more often we hear that, the more often we might be to believe that in fact that is true because we use familiarity or fluency as it's called as a heuristic for accuracy. Now, one of the things that I'm going to talk about specifically is how we reject unwelcome corrections. And one of the reasons why we do it is because we reject unwelcome corrections because it affects who we see ourselves as being. So when people care about politics, and they're given political information that runs counter to their predispositions, that it challenges their worldview. It challenges not only what they already believe, but it challenge, fundamentally challenges who they are. And so they automatically and immediately bring great mental effort trying to protect their worldview and their self-identity. So next slide, please. So my research partner, Brendan Nyhan, and I, several years ago, did an experiment in which we gave everybody in the experiment uh, information, uh, a clip from a George Bush speech in which he talked about the 2001 and 2003 tax cuts and talked about how those tax cuts magically paid for themselves because by decreasing marginal rates, we're able to stimulate the economy. By stimulating the economy, we're able to increase net tax revenues to the US Treasury. The unfortunate thing for former President Bush is that this is not true. Tax cuts in this particular case did not increase government revenue. In fact, if you look at the White House's own economic reports, it shows that there is a massive decrease in revenue following these tax cuts. So what we did is we had an experiment. Everybody got this information from George Bush. One half of the respondents, randomly assigned, received an additional correction or received additional information with a correction saying that, in fact, this wasn't true. And this wasn't true according to the White House's own uh, economic releases. And a fascinating thing happened as a result. When liberals got this correction, when we were later asked whether or not the Bush tax cuts increased revenue, they performed slightly better. Those saying that the Bush tax cuts increased revenue went down slightly as you can see in the first two bars, going from the light gray to the dark gray, a slight decrease. However, conservatives who received this correction, compared to conservatives who did not receive this correction, became dramatically more likely to say that, in fact, tax cuts increased government revenue. So we gave them information that tax cuts decreased revenue, and their response was, there's no way that can be true, I've spent so much mental effort on counter-arguing this, I actually now, when asked several minutes later, am going to say even more affirmatively that tax cuts increased government revenue. Now, this should be very troubling for democracy, and in many respects should be potentially troubling for you as PR people. If the very people that I'm trying to reach and trying to convince, not only does talking to them or trying to convince them potentially fall on deaf ears, it may fall on active ears, and I'm actually doing something that's horrifically counterproductive for what I'm trying to do. Next slide. There is, however, some limited reason for hope. So my uh, research partner and I have tried a couple of different ways in which we might be able to improve uh, being able to get people to update their beliefs um, so that we can increase uh, factual awareness or, or, or make people believe things that are, in fact, correct about politics. And there are two very different manipulations that we tried in this follow-up experiment. 
And specifically what we're doing in this experiment is we're asking people whether or not from the period of January 2010 to January 2011, the number of people employed in the United States in terms of net number of jobs has gone up or down. And we gave people a graph of that information. And over this period, the number of jobs actually does go up. The unemployment rate bounces around because there are a lot of complicated factors that go into calculating the uh, unemployment rate, but the actual number of jobs increases. And we just wanted to see if people, when given this information in graphical form, would be willing to update their beliefs. And in fact, we found that our graphs were incredibly effective. That when information was presented to people in a graphical form, and trend data over time is obviously very easy to present in some sort of graphical form, we found that people were in fact able to update their beliefs. Now as PR people, you may say, great, graphs, awesome. Now I know to use graphs whenever I can. Now let me put up the caveats. My research partner and I don't understand why graphs work yet. There are any number of reasons why graphs may work. It may be that uh, graphs take more cognitive effort, and therefore people have less mental uh, resources available to counter-argue. It may be that uh, it narrows the scope of available counter-arguing, and so it takes away the ambiguity of the signal. We've, in fact, done another experiment. We directly compare graph corrections to text corrections, and graph corrections continue to work better. But I think the far more fascinating thing has to do with the other thing that we tried, which focuses on what happens if, instead of just giving people new information, what if we try and get them to change how they think about themselves? So we tried what's known as a self-affirmation manipulation, which we stole blatantly from psychology. We're political scientists. We have no shame in stealing. And so some respondents received a task in which they were asked to choose from a list of values what value was most important to them. Importantly, something related to politics was not on this list. And so they were able to choose things like being good at school, uh, friends and family, uh, being successful in business, and a host of other things. And then we asked them to write a short essay in which they would talk, ab write about some time in which they had lived up to this value and that had made them feel good about themselves. Then we asked them whether or not in the past year, we did this in February 2011, the number of jobs in the United States had gone up. And here's the most fascinating part. For those whom the economy was not an important issue, getting the self-affirmation compared to getting nothing, and we're only looking now at people uh, whether they who did not receive the graph, no effect. If we look at people who didn't get the graph, and didn't get the affirmation, there's a huge spike in the number of people saying that the number of jobs actually decreased. And one thing I should point out on this slide, Chris and Yuri, since you can't see it, is that we're looking at a sample now of only people who disapprove of the job Obama has been doing on the economy. The huge spike, if the economy is really important to you and you haven't been affirmed, the highest proportion of people who believe that the number of jobs has decreased in the, that previous year, over 60%, which is factually inaccurate. To those people that we give the information, I mean the affirmation, but no corrective information, that rate is cut almost in half. And so it is now just like people for whom the economy is not the most important issue. So just by getting people, the, giving people the opportunity to reaffirm their self-worth, reaffirm their identity in some domain other than politics, even without corrective information, they suddenly become much more open to reporting that which is true, suggesting that they do, in fact, deep down have this knowledge at some level, but it's their self-identity that prevents them from being able to report it. So there is some reason for help, or for hope. That is, there are some ways that you can communicate information that seem to work and seem to be persuasive, but when we are trying to persuade people, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is people's self-identity, what they already believe, how they view themselves is really important in terms of how we can have successful uh, messages. Now, I, one of the things that I do want to say, since this is a group of uh, PR people, is I tell you some of this with a little bit of reticence, in that one of the things that I am worried about 
in terms of an academic who's trying to figure out how we can make people believe things that we want them to believe, obviously potentially is a demagogue's toolkit. So in part with some of the lecture last night uh, on ethics, I hope that you, if you have gleaned anything that is helpful, I hope you use this power for good and not for evil. Thank you very much. Back to you, Chris. <clears throat> Fantastic. So the, the takeaway from that, Jason, that I've got here, first of all, we have to be wise about how we use this, but it is so much of our self-identity tied up into what we proclaim as a point of view or a belief, and that therefore, on the one hand, graphs may help, but graphs alone uh, without this self-affirmation manipulation, meaning basically tell the other person they're smart, tell the other person they're worldly, tell the other person they're great, then show them a graph. But if you don't address the self-identity part, it's really an uphill climb. So with that, let's move on to our second panelist. This is Raymond Marr. He's an associate professor of psychology at York University. You may have seen his work cited in the New York Times Sunday Review story called Your Brain on Fiction. Ladies and gentlemen, Raymond Marr. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, uh, Chris, for inviting me, and thank you, Stephanie, for uh, organizing all of this. So as Chris mentioned, I'm in the Department of Psychology, uh, which apparently means I'm a victim of theft, um, <laughs> at uh, York University in Toronto, not the University of York in the UK, which is why my accent is funny, but not that kind of funny. Um, so my research is really about imagination. and. What I study is how we imagine ourselves in the worlds of fiction. So when we read a book, we watch television or watch a film, we imagine ourselves as, as if we're a part of this narrative world. And we're likely to experience thoughts as well as feelings that are consistent with what's going on in this fictional world. So it's not at all uncommon, for example, to become emotional while watching a film. You can even be brought to tears, literal tears, at a, a very emotionally moving book, for example. Um, and what I'm interested in is how these experiences uh, can be thought of as a cognitive and emotional simulation of experience. So these are heavily uh, embodied experiences that we're simulating. Uh, and more importantly, after we're done engaging in the world of the fictional narrative, when we, when we return to the real world, I believe that these experiences that we have in fictional worlds can have an impact on our re real world thoughts, beliefs, and feelings. So quite similar to how a pilot learning to fly a plane will fly in a flight simulator, you can think about our experiences in fictional worlds as a simulation of experience that is going to change us in some way in the real world. And my own particular research really has to do with empathy, because I believe that stories are fundamentally social uh, in content. So stories are really about people, other people, relationships between people, interpersonal uh, interactions, conflicts, goals. And therefore, our repeated exposure to these simulated interpersonal worlds should have implications for our own capacity to uh, empathize with another person or take their perspective. So my initial investigations into this topic were neuroscience in nature. And what I wanted to know was whether there was a common neural network that seemed to underlie our ability to, un to understand a story, as well as understand what another person in the real world is thinking or feeling. So I did a couple of studies on this, uh, mainly meta-analytic, which means that I took the results of individual studies, individual neuroimaging studies, for example, that would use functional MRI or PET, and I aggregated all those results to sort of get an overall picture of the brain regions that are reliably associated with both social cognition or our ability to understand what people are thinking and feeling, as well as story comprehension. And what I found was that there was a remarkable overlap between the two, which is consistent with the idea that we are employing our ability to make mental inferences or understand what people are thinking as we engage with stories. Uh, now, it turns out that this neural network is also shared by a bunch of other processes that might be somewhat unexpected, things like autobiographical memory, daydreaming, um, sometimes spatial navigation, 
And I think that what underlies all these different processes that appear to tap this uh, identical neural network is imagination. So our, our ability to construct in our minds uh, a vivid representation that includes visual information, se sensory information like smells, as well as uh, emotional information, often drawing upon our own past experiences. After this, these neuroscience investigations, I did a few behavioral studies. And I was interested in this idea that if it's the case that when we're reading a book or watching a film that we're constantly engaging these sort of perspective-taking or empathizing skills, then it might be the, the fact or it might be possible that individuals who read a lot of books would be better at understanding what other people are thinking and feeling. Uh, and this sort of runs counter to the stereotype, I would say, because I think there's a stereotype of frequent readers as being somewhat socially awkward because they've removed themselves from the social world, so they've chosen the company of print over peers. Um, but what I found in my data was that individuals who had been exposed to more fiction tended to better on a test of social abilities, controlling for their general intelligence, their gender, their English fluency, uh, as well as their trait personality. And this was not the case for nonfiction. Uh, I replicated this in a larger sample with some additional controls. I also replicated it within a sample of preschoolers, so uh, young children between the ages of four and six. Between the ages of four and six, children go through a remarkable developmental stage in which they begin to understand that other people have thoughts and feelings that might differ from their own thoughts and feelings. And what I found was that these children between the ages of four and six, though among those who had been exposed to more children's storybooks, uh, they were actually more advanced in this capacity to understand that other people have mental states. And in this study, I began to look at other types of media. So I looked at both television and film, and I found that the effect was also true of film. So children that had, who had been exposed to more children's films also were more advanced in this sort of social developmental stage. Uh, but the same cannot be said of television. And I controlled for things like um, the parents' uh, SES, um, parental income, um, the child's vocabulary, for example. So ruling out alternative explanations. Now, some work that might be of particular interest to you all as public relations and communicators is work by others who have looked at what they term narrative persuasion. So this is the idea of, can we change people's attitudes and beliefs uh, using exposure to fictional narratives, like narratives that are explicitly labeled as this is fiction. Um, a lead researcher in this area is Melanie Green, who's at uh, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. And what she's found is that the more that people are transported into the world of the narrative, the more that they feel immersed in the story, the more likely they are to change their beliefs to be more consistent with those that are expressed in the world of the narrative. And what's important to note is that these attitudes and beliefs don't have to be explicitly stated. You know, it works when the attitudes and beliefs are explicitly stated, but even if it's more of an implicit theme in the narrative, you will still see attitudes align more in that direction uh, the more that people are transported or absorbed into these fictional stories. And what's also interesting is that it doesn't seem to matter too much whether you explicitly label this as fiction or nonfiction. So even if you tell people right off the bat, this is just a piece of fiction, the effects appear to be roughly the same. Uh, other people have tried to compare narrative fiction to other forms of persuasive communication, like lectures or nonfiction essays, and what they found is that narrative fiction tends to be more effective. Theoretically, people believe that fiction sort of um, is a, a somewhat more subtle way to have people consider a set of ideas because it's not a blatant um, attempt to change their own opinion. Uh, what's also interesting is some work by Marcus Apple, who's at the University of Linz in Austria. And what he found is that it doesn't even necessarily have to be an idea that's explicitly stated or an uh, implicit theme in a narrative, but even particular characters in a narrative can affect how people think and feel. So he published a great paper uh, called Reading About Someone Stupid Can Make You Stupid. Um, and what he found is that individuals who are randomly assigned to read about an uh, unintelligent soccer hooligan subsequently performed worse on a test of knowledge. 
compared to individuals who read an unrelated text. And uh, what was really important about his work as well is that he really found that it had to do with this idea of assimilation or becoming a part of the story, but you could also find contrast effects. So if people read the same story about this unintelligent soccer hooligan and were instructed to think of ways that they weren't like that individual, they actually did better than those who read the unrelated test, text because they contrasted themselves with that target uh, individual. So that about wraps it up for what I have to say. Um, and I'll pass it back to you, Chris. Thank you very much. Give it up for Raymond Marr, everyone. Chris. Now, Raymond, uh, one quick question on that. It sounds to me like, as, as PR professionals, therefore, you've done some work on fiction versus nonfiction impact. It sounds to me, if I were to, to uh, have a takeaway, if we could craft a fictional story, if we could craft narratives that will transport people, we could be more effective than a sort of bullet pointing of benefit. And when it comes to working on behalf of our clients, their products, their services, their reputation, is that true that we need to think more like fiction writers? I think that the, the key distinction isn't really one between fiction and nonfiction, but it's really the distinction between stories and expository or exposition or essays. You know, I think that making something narrative in nature, something that's a story, regardless of whether you label it as a true story or a fictional story, it's uh, the more absorbing it is, I think that the more people will become involved and able to imagine that perspective and, and possibly the more persuasive it'll be, yes. Great, thank you so much. The next panelist here is Yuri Hassan. He's on the line with us now. He's assistant professor in the psychology department, and he's at the Neuroscience Institute at Princeton University. He got his PhD in neurobiology from the Weizmann Institute in Israel, and he was a postdoctoral fellow at NYU before he moved to Princeton. Now, I happened upon Yuri, and I think he was a madman. I started emailing him about a year ago when I discovered his research on neural coupling. Yuri, over to you. Hi, all. I'm happy to be here. I'm sorry that I could not attend in person. Okay, so uh, next slide. I cannot see the slide, but hopefully it will be fine. Uh, so usually scientists try to understand simple things, and they're really using very simple stimuli. But in my lab, we're taking another approach. And next slide, please. And we're looking on really how people are interact with others in real-life situations. And it's not enough to convey people rich stimuli in which they see people communicate. I think that it's really important that people will be engaged in communication as I'm doing now. So what we actually ask in next slide is we ask the subject to really to try to communicate to other brains in real time. And while they are communicating, we're measuring their brain responses and try to see how they respond. Next slide. So to give you the frame of reference, let's go back to vision. Hopefully you can see on the screen now a brain looking on a flower. And this, and this flower actually is sending electromagnetic waves that go into your eyes, and therefore your brain is processing this electromagnetic wave, and your brain is coupled to the external environment. In communication, it's a very similar process. So next slide, please. Now, hopefully you can see two brains talking. So what's happening during communication is that similar thing is happening. Now, me, as a speaker, I'm transmitting electromagnetic waves that go into your brain. So it's very similar to the flower. But there's also a difference. Well, the flower doesn't care about your brain, and it will transmit its waves, whether it will be in the room or not. I do care about your brain. And the message that I'm transmitting was designed by my brain to affect your brain. And if my message is effective, then we'll be coupled. So this is exactly what we study. We're measuring the speaker brain while telling the story, and we're measuring the listener brain while they listen to the story, and we try to see what happens. So I will give you an example of a story that we are using. Next slide. And, and now, in this story, 
you have a real, a real guy going and tell a real life story. It's a, he's taking from storytelling event in New York City, and I will give you an example of the story that he's going to tell. Next. So I'm banging out my story, and I know it's good. And then I start to make it better. <laughs> by adding an element of embellishment. Reporters call this making shit up. <laughs> and they recommend against crossing that line. But I had just seen the line crossed between a high-powered dean and a salt with a pastry. And I kind of liked it. So, next slide, please. So now we have listeners listening to this real-life story in the brain while measuring their brain responses. And what we are doing, we're taking one listener's brain to model the other listener's brain. So, for example, now the image you can see, yellow, uh, yellow square in the two listeners' brain, and this is the auditory cortex, and we see whether the brain responses are similar when they are listening to the story. Next slide, please. So as you can see now on the slide, you can see actually five people, auditory cortex responses while they're listening to the story. And as you can see, the responses over time, this is the brain signal, actually is very similar across all listeners while they are listening to the story. Not a perfect similarity, but it's a very powerful one and you can really detect it by eye without even implying any statistical tool to analyze it. Next slide. And we discover that it's not only the auditory cortex that responds similarly across brains while they're listening to this real-life narrative. Actually, many, many different brain areas are, are working in the same way across all listeners while they're listening to this talk. Next slide, please. And this and these areas include auditory areas that process the sound, language areas that extract the meaning out of the sound bite, and even frontal areas and medial prefrontal areas that really extract high level information about the meaning of this story. Next slide. So basically, what we see with the listeners, we see that these this stories, this narrative, tend to evoke very similar and complex responses across all of listeners. And we're thinking that that can serve as the basis of the communication. In other words, we're thinking that the speaker, this is exactly what the speaker is want to do. So if now is the sound line clear, and you can really understand what I'm doing, basically what I'm doing now, I'm evoking similar brain responses across all of you as a listener. So next we went and so what is the relationship between the speaker and the listener? Next slide. So now we have a speaker in the fMRI scanner telling a story and other listeners in other scanners listening to the story. And now we have the brain responses of the speaker while telling the story and we're going to compare it to the brain responses of the listener while they listen to the story. Next slide. So now what we're going to do, we're going to take the speaker brain and we try to see whether the responses in the speaker brain are similar to the responses in the listener brain. Next slide, please. So now hopefully you see a brain map on the screen. And this brain map tells you how similar are the responses between the speaker and the listener, or how couple are the brain responses. And as you can see, there are many brain areas that respond similarly between the speaker and the listener. This is good again, auditory areas, A1 plus, but also language areas, as the tip is there, the pure temporal virus, or vocal areas, and again, frontal areas, as the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and medial prefrontal cortex. Next slide. Next, we can see that the level of understanding is really coupled to the level of brain coupling. So on the x-axis, you can see the extent of brain coupling between the speaker and each of the listener. 
And on the y-axis, you can see the extent of understanding of each speak, of each listener. And you can see that the better the brain counseling between the listener and the speaker, the better the understanding. So we can really know how effective is the communication signal by looking on the brain response. Next slide. So the way we think about communication, we think it like dancing. What's happening in communication is that I'm trying to affect your brain, and then you respond to me. So by acting and communicating, I'm constraining your responses, and your reaction constrains mine. And if we manage to do it, then it's really a joint action. Next slide. So you can think on the dynamical interaction between communication on different levels. There are different types of dancing. There's communication in which I'm trying to persuade you. There's a communication in which I'm trying to manipulate someone or teach some, someone or share information and gossip. So what we do in the lab is we're looking on this dynamical interaction across this speaker and listener and try to characterize this different form of communication and understand the neural underlying processes that enable us to communicate with each other. Thank you. Back to you, Chris. Thank you so much, Yuri. Now, one thing that I read in your neural coupling research that I gave, absolutely gave me chill was when you put a storyteller in one scanner and a story listener in a separate scanner and they could not see each other and did not know each other. You then looked at how the listener's brain patterns would mirror the storyteller's brain pattern. And as they got more deeply into the story, the lag between the teller and the listener shrank until it was nothing. And then the part that really freaked me out, that the story listener began to accurately project and precede in their brain imaging what the storyteller was about to say. And this was just amazing. It really took the, the saying, get somebody on the same wavelength, and almost made it literal. I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit more about whether that was a surprising finding and what we as communicators can learn about a style or a technique in narrative that might get people coupled with us. Uh, it, it's a really good question. So first I want to say that it's not enough to be a good speaker. You really need an attentive listener. And as was Raymond and Jason were telling me, you before, if the listener will try to block the information, there is no way that you can penetrate. So now what we saw is that if you have an attentive listener, in many cases, is really trying to predict what you're going to say next. If it's doing this predictive processes, and actually it's brain responses coming before your brain, your brain responses as a speaker, communication gets better. And I think these predictive processes are really crucial for effective communication. So it's really from a two-way interaction. But for what I've also seen, whether it's Raymond Marr's work or others, the brain as stimulator. It's very important in our technique, I would uh, hypothesize to you guys, that we as communicators speak in a visual way, that if we can speak in a way that allows you as a listener to create a picture or even a movie in your own mind, you can better follow along than if I take an expository bullet point route. Would you agree with that, Raymond? Yeah, yeah. I think you know the richness of anecdotes have been found to be important for engaging audiences and, and then therefore understanding your perspective, absolutely. So with that, I'm going to turn back to Stephanie to manage in case there's time for Q&A, so I won't monopolize that. Arun, I hope there is because this is really an assemblage of three rock stars, and I appreciate it if we really, really give them an enormous round. I'm so grateful for them to, to uh, appear in this, so please humor me and gratify me. I can't see you in the audience, but if you could give that a whoop and a holler, I'd really appreciate it for our panelists. Thank them. And thank you, Chris. Let us know if there's time for Q&A. Any questions? Um, I would like to 
try to understand, because it's, it sounded to me a little bit like your research and what I heard afterwards was a little bit contradictory. So I, are we um, supposed to understand or conclude from your research that what made a difference in the way people look at the, the statement about Bush uh, tax uh, policy was based on the fact that the first information was more um, kind of subjective, was a statement. And the graph looks, of course, one can manipulate graphs, but it looks to the average person as something objective therefore has more credibility and also takes the ideology out of it. Um, is, is that a fair conclusion? And then it kind of contradicts the other thing about fictional storytelling because that obviously is something that's more imaginary, is more personal. So how do I conciliate the two <laughs> studies? So I, I think it's a really good set of questions. I, I think that they're are a couple of different things going on. First, um, you know, my research partner and I don't fully understand why graphs work. What we know is that um, across several different experiments, they've all worked. They've all had um, similarity in that they are all reporting trend data over time. So uh, the number of insurgent attacks um, in Iraq uh, before and after the um, strategy change known as the, the surge, uh, the number of jobs uh, over the course of a one-year period in the United States, and uh, global average surface temperature um, over the last several decades. So we know that graphs are, are compelling in at least these instances of reporting trend data. Um, I think part of the differences between what my research shows and um, I think what Raymond shows is that I'm dealing in a sort of very specific area of, of factual questions um, and not necessarily broader truths about um, uh, the human condition or, or social interaction. Um, and I'll, I'll let Raymond speak, speak more to that. You know, this is a sort of a narrow slice. I, I wish I understood better why graphs work. Um, my gut is that it's a combination of it takes away the ability um, to counter argue or um, removes ambiguity from the signal. Um, it makes what is being presented much more clear. And then I think graphs are actually, people have to employ a fair degree of cognitive effort to read graphs and understand what they say. And I think that's probably key in understanding why they're they're more effective. If you have to allocate cognitive effort to understanding the signal that's coming in, that's left fewer cognitive resources you have available to counter argue whatever's coming in. But that's a hunch. That, that's not, we haven't been able to, to directly test that hypothesis. Yeah, a really great question. And I think I can help reconcile this as well. So by and large, it is true that if you present a text, it doesn't really matter if you label it as fiction or nonfiction, you still find the same sort of change in attitude. The one um, place where you do see that it makes a difference is when people already hold strong beliefs. So there was a study that was done with regards to uh, um, abortion rights versus pro-life arguments, and certainly for people who already had strong beliefs regarding um, this issue, the, the, the fiction labeling was glommed onto and they quickly disregarded that information. Right. So most of the persuasive uh, studies that I'm talking about have to do with much sort of, as um, Jason mentioned, you know, broader issues as well as issues that people do not already hold strong pre-existing beliefs regarding. And, and as somebody who studies politics, pretty much everything I look at is, is something where people already have pretty strong beliefs. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.